Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for joining us. My name is Scott Beatty, and I'm a, a partner at Cologne and Beatty Law Group and also a columnist for the Central Valley Business Journal. And uh, I was very appreciative of Jason's comment earlier about optimism. Uh, on behalf of the Business Journal, I know we always try to pursue the uh, positive, bring information to our local businesses that's useful and helps add value uh, to what they do in the community. So it's with that spirit that I welcome you. I'd like to say that uh, I'm a bit of an educational enthusiast myself. Uh, I've got advanced degrees in law and in tax. I've also uh, pursued when some people coach football or basketball, I'm out there coaching the Science Olympiad and the uh, Academic Decathlon, Decathlon and things of that nature. And my partner sometimes calls me the professor. That's uh, not actually a distinction that I've earned, but uh, I think his sentiment is that he appreciates uh, when people pursue things with both an eye toward the intellectual and toward the practical. And it's really in that spirit that I want to welcome you here today for this presentation. Uh, it's really the spirit of educational excellence in combination with the practical side of things. What's uh, what's valuable to our region? What is our economy really like in, in our region? So uh, I welcome you joining us at the inaugural presentation of the CSU Stanislaw Business Forecast Report. And uh, as you know, the report uh, was prepared by the Foster Farms Endowed Professor of Business Economics, Dr. Gochi Sotomayor. Uh, the university's goal is that the endowed profession, professorship and this biannual report will serve and support the regional business community by providing data and forecasts that keep the businesses and industries of our region informed as to the true economic conditions of our area. Um, I'm very pleased first to introduce Dr. Ham Shervani, president of the university. He's been president here since 2005. And it's really been under his leadership that the university has flourished. Uh, it's been recognized for the last six years uh, by Princeton Review as one of the top 400 universities in the nation. And uh, he's really spearheaded the endowed professorship program and has brought in, in combination with Ron Foster and Foster Farms, uh, Dr. Uh, Sotomayor for this report. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to have you join me in welcoming Dr. Shivani. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, there is no more introduction. Uh, Goche, let's, uh, let's get on with it. <laughs> and uh, let's, uh, we are, I'm going to help in the beginning and then get off and come back at the end. Go ahead. Um, let me start. Uh, a couple of um, um, uh, pieces of information. First of all, uh, our forecast, the forecast that um, Goche has uh, uh, really worked in the past six uh, months on, is not for Stanislaus County. It's for entire San Joaquin Valley, not San Joaquin County either. San Joaquin Valley, so it includes San Joaquin, Stanislaus, Merced, Madera, Fresno, Kings, Tuller, and Kearns. They're all area. Why? Several reasons. One, uh, the economy of a scale. You know, when you're talking about uh, just one county, the economy of a scale is not sufficient enough to, that your projections, your forecasting will be as, as accurate or close to reality as you can. Number two is, uh, most of these counties are not very diversified. Some are, some are not. Certainly San Joaquin County is more diversified than Stanislaus County. Fresno is more diversified than all. But some, you know, uh, Madera is not. And so there, when you combine them together, it, it would be a much better way of looking at the, the uh, future. So um, that's uh, basically the report of the coverage area. Now, uh, you may want to ask later on, are, you gonna, are we going to do some 
uh, forecasting about a specific county. Yes, as uh, Dr. Sotomayor gets settled in and uh, is going to be uh, uh, engaged in more reports, yes, uh, there might be selective, county, uh, selective counties within the uh, San Joaquin Valley that he's going to be focusing on. Now, uh, the approach that Goche is using is quite different than some of the other approach. I'm not going to mention specific uh, uh, places uh, that do forecasting, but uh, the, his approach is different, and I want him to talk about then I come back again. Okay. We're using several different approaches in our analysis. Uh, first and foremost, we're using a new approach, forecasting an interval rather than a point forecast. In doing that, we're using 95% confidence intervals. Since this is our first time doing this, uh, we're using 95%, but in the future, we'll be using narrower bands. Uh, when the actual value falls within that range, it's an accurate forecast. Second, we're de establishing several benchmarks, uh, one benchmark being the long-run 10-year uh, average growth rate. This is kind of similar to the natural rate of unemployment uh, in the past 10 years or so in the U.S. Unemployment rate, uh, the natural rate uh, fluctuated between 5.5 to 6 percent. For the Valley, uh, it is around uh, twice as much. We checked the data recently, 11.8, uh, 11.4 uh, percent. And when the unemployment, actual unemployment rate comes above that, we say that unemployment rate is high. For example, in the U.S., unemployment rate right now is 9 percent. And in the Valley, uh, it, was, it is at 14.8. During the first half of the uh, 2011, it was at around 16.5, and it's coming down to 14.8 percent. Uh, third, we're using a model that has proven itself to do a better job in terms of forecast accuracy, uh, in, in terms of generating those out of, accurate out-of-sample forecasts. Also, it does a better job of predicting the turning points. Uh, in other words, predicting the direction of change. It is very difficult to, in forecasting business to predict turning points. So if a, an observation there comes up, uh, misses the, actual, uh, the forecasted value, but ends up predicting the uh, turning point, it is also considered an accurate uh, forecast. As you'll see when you get the report, the report is comprised of four uh, main sections. These sections are uh, employment indicators, real estate and housing, prices and inflation, and lastly, banking and money markets. Several, uh, several times uh, we have referred to as report. So uh, if some of you, I see that you're writing and so you can, uh, you're welcome to write as many notes as you want. However, we have a report for you. Everything that Dr. Sotomayor is going to present in a much more detail because the presentation is the uh, basically highlights of the report. So on the way out, we're going to give you, we're not going to give you now because we want you to listen. <laughs> and when you're leaving, you can take it and it's a reference and uh, as uh, for every presentation, uh, we're going to have this report uh, produced. Now, um, what are the highlights of the report uh, is basically He's going to be talking about it, but I wanted to highlight, uh, focus on uh, uh, the 2011, which was a volatile year, and and obviously from what we have read, what we have done, the research that has been done by numerous uh, centers and institutes and outfits tells us that 2012 ain't going to be any better than 2011. So I'm sorry that we don't have that great news for you. Uh, ongoing housing uh, slum, lingering national unemployment uh, at around 10 percent, but of course in Central Valley and in San Joaquin Valley you're talking about 16 percent, uh, which is much higher. Uh, uh, lower consumer confidence. Uh, of course, uh, Jason was referring to some of the uh, retail uh, indicators that are going up, but those retail inc indicators are based on the money uh, that was supposed to go to mortgage, and they don't, they're not paying their mortgages, now they're spending on retail, so there is, there is a lot of uh, 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 issues there, complex issues. Then, of course, uh, um, 
uh, underperforming of the stock market, as you can see, is like a roller coaster every day. But uh, on, if you look at draw a line through this up and down, it's pretty much a steady, and uh, there hasn't, uh, and if if anything, is inclining down. Uh, the last is the phase two of uh, quantitative easing, which is probably the most uh, complicated and problematic issue. The latest news from the time we put these slides together uh, up to today, uh, as you know, just the other day, uh, Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve essentially gave $13 billion, again, another loan to the major banks in this country. So essentially what they're doing, this is $13 billion, again, to Chase and Wells and Bank of America and so on and so forth, so the four of them. They, uh, essentially, uh, we are uh, continuing to print money. And uh, so that's really the the situation of uh, next year and uh, in a kind of lump sum. Um, I'm going to stop here and uh, uh, let Goche make the presentation, then we'll come back uh, uh, at the end. Okay, we're going to start with consumer confidence index. This, we're not predicting this. <laughs> this is a leading indicator. It has some predictive power. Uh, we're beginning with consu consumption expenditure because two-thirds of the U.S. economy, as you know, is consumption. It is the driving engine of the U.S. economy. Consumer confidence index hit a 30-year low in July of 2011, and it created some concerns. Uh, the concern was, is this a, a permanent uh, event, or is it temporary? Uh, fortunately, though, in the following months, it started registering increasing values, and right now the consensus is that it is of temporary uh, a nature rather than a more permanent one. We did forecast uh, the na nationwide uh, real GDP growth. Uh, as you can see there, the bands are uh, the mean most likely value, and then the green one is the upper band, the red one is the lower band, forecasting an interval. The U.S. business cycle is now in a slower than expected recovery phase. However, even though the major forecasting centers are cutting back their growth forecasts, none so ever right now is forecasting a recession. In line with their forecast, we are predicting that the GDP growth, even though in 2000 year, 2011, first, uh, second quarter registered 1% low rate of growth, uh, the model predicts slower than expected growth in quarter four, and this is going to extend to 2012 and 2013 at an average rate of 2.10%. Uh, in the third quarter of 2011, however, the GDP growth came out to be uh, surprisingly high at 2.5%. It was later revised to 2%. This is at, uh, it's, it, it is twice as, as high as what, had, what it had prevailed um, <clears throat> in the previous quarter. So that is somewhat indicating that the economy is picking up uh, some traction, and we're also indicating uh, we're, so we're also getting some evidence out of consumption expenditure, uh, vibrant consumption expenditure, as we've seen in this Black Friday, breaking records in terms of number of attendees. We're going to be using the Bureau of Labor Statistics super sector classification. The first one we're going to be we're looking at is uh, the total employment. This is in levels. As you can see, during the recessionary period, uh, it declined, leveled off, and then started to provide, uh, perform uh, weekly, uh, showing uh, slight growth. It is en route, en route to its catching its long run uh, trend. These bands are wide because of the volatility of the series. Seasonal volatility here is causing these bands to be high. Once we compare year to year um, the rates of changes, the picture becomes more accurate, as I had indicated earlier. This here is a 10-year long-run uh, average growth equivalent to the natural rate 
uh, of the um, employment growth corresponding to the uh, unemployment rate. But we're doing this in terms of employment uh, growth. This year is the two-year benchmark. And over here, we have the 2010 average and 2011 average. Compared to this benchmark, in, in the past two years, it has done very ba uh, bad. We recovered a little bit, all still in the negative territory, and that recovery continued into 2011 for the first nine months. So the trend is, although in the negative territory, it is improving. Our forecasts indicate that in 2012, there is going to be positive growth, and more on the positive side than the negative side, and in 2013, the growth on average is going to materialize at 0.31%. Overall, in the forecasting interval, the average growth will be 0.37 positive growth. This is an interesting graph. The blue line you see there is the labor force growth in the region. The red one that you see is the employment growth. Because of the influx of population in the area since 2007, labor force grew much faster. Labor force grew much faster than employment, creating this wedge, which is very significant. But look at what happened since January of 2011. The structure is changing. The two lines are intersecting. This wage is no longer present. In fact, employment is going head to head in terms of growth with labor force, and it's slightly higher, indicative of the structure uh, changing. This discrepancy seems to be reversing beginning from January of 2011. Now, it is to be seen whether this is a, of a more temporary or more uh, in a permanent nature. The new numbers will tell us what's happening there. This is comparing the San Joaquin Valley uh, employment growth, which is the blue line. And the red line here is the state's employment growth. Historically, San Joaquin Valley grew, the employment growth exceeded that of the state's employment growth. Up until here, this happens to correspond to the same period, January of 2011 and beyond. There, California's employment growth is exceeding that of the Valley's employment growth. What is that indicating? It may indicate that these two regions, the inland region and the coastal region, are segmented. And perhaps this labor, force, uh, labor market stability is happening more to, uh, to, to a greater extent in the coastal region, only to be spilled over to the inland region uh, with a, a lag. And that discrepancy over the latter part of the sample appears to be uh, the highest. Again, the numbers that are coming in will tell us whether this is going to last or it's only going to be a temporary uh, one. The next super sector classification we're using uh, along with the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the education and health services employment. Uh, look at this line, it's very robust. You can draw a ruler here, you don't even have to forecast this. The intervals came very close to each other because of the less volatility that came, uh, was present here. Uh, even in the recessionary period, it grew at 0.9%. And that is gonna become clearer uh, when we do the yearly rates of growth comparisons. In 2011, as you can see from this blue line, grew at 1%. This is the long run average growth of the series. This is our benchmark. Is it going to go back to this? It's grew a little bit above 2.5%. It's registered positive growth during the recessionary period and in 2011. In the forecasting period 2012 and 2013, the series is expected to stay positive with 0.57 in 2012, 1.37% in 2013. The pattern is projected to extend into 2012 and 2013. That's the retail, I mean, the retail sector, however, 
is not as strong as manufacturing. Retail is a weak area. You'll see, you'll get to read that when you get the report. And we're talking about the areas that are uh, stronger, relatively speaking. Manufacturing employment did a lot uh, better. Uh, <coughs> but you see the, the seasonal pattern here, very volatile. Surprisingly, the benchmark average 10-year growth rate was at negative 0.7 percent. The decline became worse in, two, in the two-year period and in 2010. But however, and look at 2011, it's registered positive growth, surprisingly. We're projecting this trend to continue into 2012, and there's going to be some inconsistent with the cycle generating dynamics of the series, some mean reverting behavior is expected to occur in 2013. But overall it is expected to stay positive and the overall average growth rate is expected to be uh, materialized at 1.8 percent. Another leading indicator that we're looking at is the Institute of Supply Management's Manufacturing New Orders Index. This is an important uh, leading indicator because it foretells the oncoming of a recession more so than other indicators. We're not forecasting this because it's a leading indicator. Again, here displayed a rising trend up until the first half of 2011, then consistent with the slowdown in the U.S. economy, it came down. But however, so far it seems to be stabilized around 50 points and consistent with what's happening to the manufacturing employment in the valley. Leisure and hospitality services was another surprising one. Again, look how it survived. The long run average growth rate is a little over 1% there, 1.3. In the recessionary period, it suffered came worse in 2010, but look at it in 2011, it's registering positive growth. The model predicts this positive growth to continue into 2012 at 0.89% on average, and into 2013 with some mean reverting behavior at 0.42%. Trade, transportation, utilities, and other farm-related sector. Again, our benchmark here is positive, suffered a decline, got a little bit less in 2010, but again in 2011, registering positive growth. There are some short-term fluctuations going on, uh, and apparently some in circles are paying more attention to short-term fluctuations than what's happening long-term. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is once you do year-to-year -year changes of, year-to-year -year comparisons of rates of changes, the picture becomes more accurate in terms of what's happening in the valley. Again, in line with the recovery in 2011, 2012 projected, value is going to be 1.16 and in 2013 it's going to be 0.76 overall it's going to grow at 0.96 percent wholesale trade as i said earlier uh, retail is relatively weak wholesale trade is the strong uh, part and the benchmark here continued to remain positive Suffered a great decline in 2010, came back rapidly up to 2011. The forecasts are predicting further growth at 2.15% in 2012, and slightly mean aversion in, at 0.41%, overall growing at 1.28%. Information services employment, 
on average, over the 10-year period, it declined at negative 3% almost. The decline became worse in 2010, but in 2011, consistent with other indicators, it is exhibiting positive growth. Again, this cycle is continuing into 2012 with 4.19% yearly growth, and into 2013, 0.87%. The overall rate of growth is expected to be 2.53%, along with the dampening behavior in 2013. Durable goods versus non-durable goods. Durable goods is not an area where the Valley has its <coughs> competitive advantage. However, non-durable goods is looking strong. The 10-year rate of growth is a little above 6%. Even in the recessionary period, it remained positive and then recovered en route to attaching its long-term average growth there. The model is predicting that this trend is going to continue into 2012 with positive rate of growth of 4.41 percent and in 2013 slightly less at 0.78 with an overall growth of 2.6. Construction employment, this is the epicenter of the housing crisis. It has declined uh, and became hyperbolic. It is expected to continue in that pattern. Declining since, two point, uh, since 2006 at negative 2.5%. Well, percentage growth-wise, it's negative over the 10-year period. Became worse in two, over the two-year period, past two years, and then 2010 improved a little bit, but again, the improvement is not enough and still in the negative territory. The projections show that this improvement is going to continue. The rate of decline is going to decrease, but it's still going to stay in the negative range. Point, um, negative 2.1 and negative 1.9. No turning point in sight. And any improvement here is deferred until the end of 2013. Consistent with construction employment, we're looking at the imputed single family building permits. It has been declining since May of 2006. Again, leveling off here, about 230 units. Decline at a very high rate. Surprisingly, in 2010, it tried to recover, but it got worse in 2011. Uh, it is trying to improve, but still uh, the rate of change is going to be negative at 2.7% negative value and 0.6% uh, in 2013. Now, what is happening to foreclosures in the western region? It has crested in 2010 and has been going down since then. The red line uh, is the federal funds rate divided by 10. The blue line showing foreclosures. It is horizontal, ind indicating that foreclosures do not appear to be responsive to the changes in the federal funds rate. Rather, it appears to be an independent process until all excess inventories are depleted, and it doesn't look like that has happened so far. This is looking at the change in housing prices. It's not the housing prices per se, but the change. The change bottomed here in the latter part of 2009, uh, and then the rate of decline decreased, but still in the negative territory, leveling off here. So housing prices are not expected to improve uh, anytime soon. Again, surprisingly, however, the, on, over the 10-year period, housing prices increased at 3%. Okay? And that became worse to year 2011. It's going to improve a little bit, but stay pretty much leveled off around 
negative uh, three percent. Next, we're going to look at the uh, inflation rate in the Western region as opposed to the one at the national level. The red one is the one at the national level. The blue one is in the Western region. Prices rose less in the Western region than at the national level. Well, it, holds, it held steady at 3%. And the impact of phase two, phase one and phase two did not appear to be that's significant. Even though there was a, a rise in inflation, it wasn't as high as expected. Although inflationary pressures remain high, as the most recent reading uh, showed, the producer's price index went down in the month of October. Uh, consistent with that, the model is not predicting any increase in the inflation rate. In fact, it's predicting that it's going to stay consistent with its long-term uh, average rate. No significant change is projected. This is the inflation rate over a 10-year period. In the recessionary period, as expected, it came down, but in 2011, it came back up. <coughs> Forecasts are indicating that it's going to pretty much stay in that range, maybe decrease a little bit, but uh, remain stable. Uh, and close to its long-term average value. Weekly wages, if you look at it, very robust, almost linear, predictable linear growth there. Grew historically at a rate higher than the inflation rate, 3.3 percent. During the recessionary period, it declined as expected. Growth in wages, about 3 percent, went down during the recessionary period, came back up. And in the forecasting interval, it is expected to be consistent with the expected decrease in the inflation rate, remain a little above 2 percent. So what is this saying? It is indicating that uh, when com companies uh, laid off workers and uh, the ones that they kept chose to pay a little bit above the inflation rate, the wages kept up with the inflation rate, real wages stay constant. The blue line here is the wage growth. The red one is the inflation rate, mostly above, which is encouraging. And the wage growth exceeded the inflation rate. And the discrepancy is becoming more significant in favor of the wage. Bank deposits in the banking sector. Banks are flooded with cash these days. Bank deposits are, have been increasing steadily. There was a uh, leveling off effect there, but it kept on increasing at a slower pace. In the 10-year period, it grew at slightly about 5% five per, five, uh, 5 went down to 25 in the recessionary period. And the forecasts are indicating that the bank deposits are going to continue to grow in 2012 and 2013. This is a lagged indicator from FDIC, so that's why we had to make some adjustments. But last time we checked, uh, the indicators were consistent with the incoming values. Projected growth at 3.05 percent. Net loans and leases, it has been increasing at a decreasing rate. Crested in December of 2008, declined the average growth rate over the 10-year period was negative. Came, the decline became worse and worse in 2011, was the worst. So interestingly, bank deposits are going up, but net loans and leases are going down. One would expect those deposits to be ultimately channeled back to loans and leases, and that's not happening. And some of the reasons might be this new regulation that's being introduced, making it harder on the part of the banks to extend loans. But this dynamic seems to be going on before that. Uh, so that's an anomaly. The rate of growth is projected to be <coughs> negative, however, improve a little bit, but mainly continue at this declining pattern. 
There, there does, does it appear to be a turning point, however, uh, in 2012. These are bank assets that are due past 90 days, that's the blue line, and assets that are in non-accrual status. Now, since the recession, they've been increasing exponentially. We did some scale adjustments here, and they have leveled off. Uh, yeah, further, the assets past due 90 days have been going down, so that's very encouraging. It looks like these are being contained so far. I'm gonna, at this point, I'm gonna ask Dr. President Shirvani to conclude. Thank you, Koshin. Come on, stand up. Um, I think we're <clears throat> basically towards the end, and um, what um, what Gorcha has done and what the data presents is that um, number one, San Joaquin economic performance um, is is basically modest uh, than national level. Um, of course, in certain uh, sections of San Joaquin, employment growth is showing some promising signs, others projected to be more problematic, uh, which is in this nature of our area. Um, but the, um, of course, uh, uh, in most of this type of area, uh, monthly, uh, uh, kind of forecasting is not very useful, but yearly comparison is, is much more appropriate and accurate. Um, but one thing which is very important for all of us to know is that um, many s counties in the United States that have diversified economy, they don't have the problems that we have. So one of the fundamental problems that we have is diversification of our counties. Our economies in various counties in the Central Valley, in San Joaquin Valley, is not diversified. So that's how it's impacting very clearly uh, the nature of uh, uh, economy and business here, as well as the unemployment. If good news is some good news is that opposite of the, um, the general perception that Valley's economy is really terrible or bad. Uh, it's not, that's not the case. Is the data says that they're doing uh, reasonably okay. I mean, okay means basically they're not in the edge of you know, bankruptcy or thing. They're, in fact, they're doing better than many counties in the United States. So if you put it together, because of that lack of diversity, it uh, kind of feeds each other. But if you really take each county separately and compare it to the various counties, it's doing much better. Um, in, um, so uh, that's really what um, uh, we were able to find out. And as you could see from um, Gorsh's presentation, every one of those indicators it was just like a very minimal in some of them almost epsilon improvement projected uh, if not and of course those are uh, basically an estimate but uh, but the uh, the interval that he was talking about is interesting is because you see that the, the most pessimistic and the most optimistic range so when you look at the report you have to kind of go along those lines and uh, the the number that is presented is basically uh, uh, is, a, is an interpretation of, yes. the, of the, the three data. And um, so, um, Gorcha, you want to say the final word? Yes. The, um, the data, these, these, the model is numbers driven. It lets the data speak for itself. It's more objective. And as the data shows, the valley economy is in a stronger position than many think. The employment is you know, on its route to catching its natural rate. Uh, as I said earlier, unemployment in this region stood at 17% just this past June. We just checked the numbers before coming here in October, it came down to 148 
the natural rate of unemployment in this region is about 11.4, 11.8%. So that is indicating that it is approaching that target rate. That is a more realistic rate than asking when are we going to get back to the pre-recession levels. That's not a realistic question because during the pre-recession we had a boom. That's like asking when are we going to have a boom again. We may never have a boom. And, and I looked in the boom years, the unemployment rate went down uh, as low as 7% here in the valley. Uh, again, a natural rate of unemployment is more realistic. It is you know, on its route to catching it. And those are the, the indicators that we should be paying attention to instead of asking you know, you know, when is there going to be another boom. Because as we saw, that cycle, boom, crisis adjustment, boom, crisis adjustment can have uh, very detrimental uh, social consequences. Uh, rather, we want a, a steady, uh, despite slow, uh, gradual improvement. Uh, that's not going to cause these socially devastating um, consequences at the end. And the, 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 the latest thing that we were um, just uh, digging and studying is that um, uh, probably, of course, this is not based on facts, but based on a uh, number of uh, projections that other uh, institutes and centers all over the world have done, uh, is that right after election, uh, within next two years, uh, there is going to be a rapid uh, inflation. Uh, because it's been bursting and they're holding it and the, this uh, Bloomberg, uh, the, the 13 billion dollar that I mentioned to you is the Bloomberg that has really uh, find out this money was kind of given quietly to banks as a loan 13 billion dollar and they identified it and flourished it and so forth. So essentially by uh, a lot of printing money the inflation has been inflation has been kept down, but eventually, after the election, is something that is not controllable. So, the value of dollar uh, is going to uh, be radically coming down. Uh, uh, that's that's the kind of things that uh, is in the broad picture. Another thing, of course, you mentioned about I, I know all the time if this question comes up that okay, uh, is the price of housing in this area is going to go up? to what it was in 2000 pi. Uh, it's, it's, uh, economists never use the term never, since I'm not an economist, I can say never. <laughs> it's maybe when we're all gone. Uh, it, it's just the, because the, if you look at the, um, the, all the projections, they're talking about by 2013, uh, end of 2013, beginning of 2014, uh, there could be almost starting to go up about like a half a percent or one percent. So if you really project that, uh, God knows how many years it's going to come to, you know, house that used to be uh, $600,000 is now $300,000. Will it go back how many years to, the, to that price? So that's the thing. The final point that I thought uh, I really um, jumped into to say that here is that uh, this diversification of our economy has a very strong relationship to university and has got to do with the workforce. We have to uh, uh, be able to produce the diversified workforce which is necessary for diversified economy to come in here and and has got, of course there is another side of it is that the regulations and city and county permit processes. I think Bill Bassett is here, he can talk about it more, he's been singing that song for a long time. Uh, so these are a factual uh, need for us to change. But we are, we're there to help all of you to, um, uh, to uh, kind of respond to your uh, uh, basically workforce need and uh, to uh, focus on R&D. Uh, and uh, looking forward to working with you. So now uh, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to stop and then ask the Q, do the Q&A. I'd like you to, uh, Dr. Sotomayor is going to entertain questions, but first please join me in giving him a round of applause for the hard work on this report. I think you'll all agree it's something we need to have more information about our economy. And so before I start uh, the question, just uh, I'd like to say that uh, I'll walk around with the mic if you have a question. So 
that your question can be heard by everyone. And I'll go ahead and lead it off since I uh, have one of my own. I like to look at uh, silver linings, Dr. Soitemeyer, and it was mentioned that uh, foreclosure rates and people not paying their mortgage might be causing some of the spending we're seeing. But uh, uh, still, home ownership is about 65% in this country. Could you comment on low interest rates and the impact that may be having on people's budgets and their ability to spend in the economy? Sure. I, mean, I, I indicated earlier the federal funds rate is at an all-time low. It's staying low. Uh, that is contributing definitely uh, in terms of um, further stimulating the economy. Uh, they have to remain low until the end of 2014 uh, for the consumption expenditures to get back on a trend. Uh, I think where is it going to be jump started? Banks have to start loaning, extending loans again. Consumers have to start spending. Employers have to start employing. And only then the consumption activity will go up and the loans will get repaid. I think cr most crucially when interest rates are low, the banks have to start extending loans. I think that's where I see uh, the problematic uh, area where uh, the economy could do a little better if loans were extended, overcoming this tight regulation. Some are arguing that this regulation is strangling economic growth. It might be true. Please, please raise your hands if you have a question. We have one back here. Yes. What is the relative contribution of demographic uh, changes to your forecasting? Okay, uh, I did put a graph there, uh, labor force growth. During the boom years, there was a big influx of population in the area that caused labor force to grow much faster than employment growth. But because of the recessionary times, uh, that influx seems to be no longer happening. Uh, it's kind of dampening as individuals move out of the valley. Some argue that they cannot because they bought these houses and they have to stay here. A good example of that is me. I mean, I have a house in Texas. I moved here. And I'm renting. So I'm not sure how credible that argument is, but there's definitely a decrease in the influx of uh, population here. Uh, and the employment growth is at the same time growing only in the negative territory, whereas labor force growth is declining, intersecting, changing the structure of the economy here. And does that answer your question? The declining. Uh, age of the labor force? Well, yes, uh, if you look at the demographics, uh, definitely uh, the, 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 young, the aging population uh, does have a, a, a negative impact uh, on the um, economy. I mean, that's, uh, it's not as like an emerging market economy where there are a lot of young people that can contribute to uh, economic performance. Here, declining age retirement people, problems with so social security is having uh, a negative consequence. You, okay, is that what you were asking in terms of demographics? large uh, increases in the unemployment in the valley maybe because of these large uh, groups of young people. That's, uh, I totally agree. I mean, they are uh, creating, uh, but at the same time, we have this aging population also, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, there are a lot of uh, young people out there that cannot find jobs. Uh, skilled work is an area in nationwide there's three million shortages shortage in terms of skilled work uh, we have to train them uh, and then provide the skills necessary to get those jobs uh, you mentioned uh, education and uh, health services were relatively strong sectors so the demographic question uh, is that affecting both those sectors the aging population needing health services the younger echo boom so to speak, uh, needing educational services? Absolutely. I mean, the shortage is so great that educational uh, institutions are falling short of meeting that demand. Uh, so definitely uh, it, is a, it is reflective of what you were saying that in terms of young people being unemployed, but it has to do with providing the, the skills to those people. 
so that they can go and find those jobs. The employers are finding it hard to, hard to match those skills with the, the, the job applicants. So that's telling quite a bit in terms of what needs to be done. Earlier this year, the Fed uh, said they would not adjust the interest rate for two years. Normally, they will use the interest rate to stimulate or control inflation. Since they've now used this arrow of saying we're not going to change it for two years, what tools does the Fed have left? That's a, like a good question. The, the Fed has to resort to non-traditional uh, tools. Uh, the tools that, uh, that are being used uh, are not um, sophisticated enough to affect the economy uh, at the moment. Uh, I am in favor of, and some may uh, disagree with this, but you know, what's the objective of the Fed? The Fed's objective is to maintain and achieve price stability and uh, minimize, therefore, uncertainty. Investors do not like uncertainty. Uh, and therefore create a positive business environment that's going to spur investments and lead to maximization of economic growth. Uh, has the Fed done that? Well, it, it is trying to achieve price stability, but I, I think it can do further. Federal, keeping the federal funds rate low is not enough. Uh, it needs to intervene a little bit more, maybe change the target rate, maybe target, target uh, the unemployment rate instead of the inflation rate, uh, as one of the board members or was arguing in favor of Evans. I was wondering if you could uh, explain or expand upon uh, employment levels for the forecast for three groups. One would be public sector in all of its forms. The other would be non-farm, and the other would be uh, farm employment levels for the uh, for the study area, the San Joaquin Valley, and particularly in how that affects household income for each of those groups. Uh, are you asking the difference between farm employment and non-farm non employment? Uh, farm, farm employment, non-farm employment, and public sector. So I, I think there's a divergency happening in those three sectors. Uh, definitely. I mean, there is. A, uh, uh, and then uh, in terms of its effect on diversification, uh, do you see that uh, as something that's bad or, or good? My question to you is that as you look at employment trends going forward, if you break out employment between those three types of segments, where are we seeing growth? Are we seeing growth primarily in the public sector as opposed to farm, the farm sector or the non-farm private sector? I think I indicated that earlier. It's the farm-related employment that's where we're seeing growth. Okay, uh, now uh, education and health employment only is about 15% of the total employment, of which 60% is private. Now, there is big divergence in terms of, obviously, what needs to be done. Uh, the Fed is divided. Uh, however, uh, you know, the unemployment is not increasing, I mean, it's not decreasing as fast as one would like. Uh, job creation on a monthly basis is increasing at about 100,000 a month, and it should be more so about 250,000. So more needs to be done uh, on the part of the Fed. And the dilemma is, you know, we're stuck in a corner there, choosing between a lower unemployment rate or a higher inflation rate. That's the dilemma, and we have to choose one. Okay, we cannot just wait and see. If the Fed choose to wait and see, and then consumers and other agents will choose to wait and see. Okay, so you have to choose between the lesser of two evils, and I guess there's the divergence. Which one would you be choosing? Would you be willing to shoulder higher inflation rates to reduce unemployment further? Is that your preference? Or is, is, would you be willing to keep inflation rate low despite this high unemployment rate? I have a question regarding the employment situation as well, and my question is, is based on secular issues. You indicated that the natural rate of unemployment here in the San Joaquin Valley is around a little over 11 percent, but could there not be secular changes going on that could, could, could put pressure on that already sort of unacceptable number to go even higher? I'm speaking specifically about issues related to the substitution of technology for employees uh, in, a, in a highly regulated economy, the globalization of the workforce, et cetera, Very, and, and the fact that we have here in the Valley one of the most uneducated populations in the United States, and despite the contributions of institutions like Stanislaus State, it's, it's like we're fighting a very, very big fire with a few 
garden hoses. So could there not be secular changes going on that could adversely affect and put pressure on raising an already unacceptable historical rate of natural unemployment to higher levels? Definitely. I mean, uh, globalization is increasing competition, uh, the skills required. And we're seeing the effects of that happening uh, and the affecting you know, the area uh, more than, uh, let's say, the coastal region. Okay, uh, we definitely have to train those individuals with the skills that are needed nationwide. Now, that's a must. Uh, that's a long-run strategy, and it's taking place. And that maybe that's why this uh, unemployment is decreasing at a slower pace than one would like. Because it takes longer for those uh, for that kind of adjustment to take place, uh, transferring individuals from unskilled to skilled labor. For the past couple of years, we've had some uncertainty in tax policy with the Bush era tax cuts uh, looking to expire at the end of 2010. They got extended for a couple of years. Does that uncertainty have a negative impact on the overall economy and these economic? factors? Absolutely. I mean, in, in, you know, investors are jittery, employers are afraid to hire, uh, consumers, same thing, they cannot uh, engage in consumption because nobody knows what's going to happen to interest rates, they don't, their credit rating is not uh, mostly uh, <coughs> high enough to obtain any loans. And uh, absolutely, I mean, the, the uncertainty is, there's a great amount of uncertainty out there. And as I said earlier, the, you know, investors do not like uncertainty. Whenever there's uncertainty, they're not going to invest. They're going to, they want to be able to make, and they want to be able to foresee into the future, make plans accordingly. And if they don't do that rationally, they won't invest, okay? And this in confusion about the taxes is contributing to that. I mean, there is, the Fed is divided, the Congress is divided, we cannot reach a decision about the deficit. All of these are adding fuel to uncertainty in the economy. That's what we need to decrease, uh, and that's not being done, okay? Uh, including the Fed, the way of wait and see approach. With the, with the decline in public revenues, we're now looking at across board cuts at state level and the federal level. Are we risking then a double dip recession when the, when the public sector faces a layoff as the private sector has? Definitely contributing. But again, even though um, there is a you know, cut in growth forecasts, no institution, you know, the World Bank, IMF, uh, Federal Reserve, no one has forecasting a double re recession thus far, okay? And our forecasts are, inconsistent, are consistent with that. Uh, again, you know, when you, you know, we don't have any option but to be optimist, okay? You know, there's a lot of pessimism out there. It's, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? If you're more pessimistic, then it's going to drive down whatever it is right now, even worse. Uh, and you need to lift those sentiments up, and that's how it's going to happen. Uh, and being, you know, being uh, having these pessimistic sentiments, it's, it's like varying ourselves into a recession globally. Uh, and common sense says that you know that's not the way to go. Uh, and uh, every uh, agent of the economy has to do its part in terms of extending out, you know, extend those loans to consumers, have them start spending. Employers will start hiring, making money, and they will start hiring again. And employment will go down. And with the money income generated, those loans will be paid back. That's how it works. Consumption is the driving engine of the U.S. economy. That's why I said, you know, Evans is the only one that's targeting, saying, hey, target the unemployment rate. Hey, that's not the best one that I like. But if I have to choose between the lesser of two evils, then I would go with unemployment rate. The U.S. in the past has shoulder 10% inflation rate, okay? Uh, I've lived in countries with 60, 65% inflation. Uh, it is, I don't think we should be afraid of that, it's especially with a well-developed economy like this. And don't be afraid uh, and, and then be optimistic. Uh, and then behave like the economy is recovering because there's, there are already signs of that. The data, the data is showing that, that there is less to be pessimistic about this year than last year. It's improving. The train is coming, okay? We're waiting on the station. It's on its way. I'd be interested in hearing your comments and assessment of California. As you know, California has had a flight of businesses leaving the state for other states, as well as California is generally ranked last in terms of its attractiveness 
among CEOs of uh, companies. So I'd be interested in your assessment of California and what's going on in California and its ability to attract and retain businesses. Well, coming from Texas, I see a lot of changes, okay? Uh, and I've lived there 10 years ago. I got my PhD in Los Angeles. I came back here. I couldn't believe the infrastructure is decaying. Uh, California is not what it used to be when I was here 13 years ago. Uh, Texas is stealing all the unemployment, but wages are low there. Uh, California needs to pick up. I mean, it needs to invest in that infrastructure. Uh, it needs to um, build, and you know, everywhere is an hour and a half di uh, distance from here. Um, enlarge that air airport in Modesto. Have regional, you know, airliners come there, fly to a major hub in the East Coast. I know a lot of you, including me, would be using that quite a bit. Invest in new infrastructure, and that's how we did it. Uh, you know, small government. Uh, in, that, all you got to do is invest in new infrastructure, have the businesses prefer that type of infrastructure rather than their own uh, location where they're, wherever they're at and come over here. I mean, we saw, you know, Blue Diamond Almonds come here and really relocate, so it happens. I mean, we just if you have to figure out what is triggering that and focus there. Okay, we're going to make that our final question, so I'd like you to thank Dr. Sotomayor for his report. Please don't forget to pick up your report, and uh, we're, we're going to be back six months from now, and next presentation, what we're going to do is uh, every six months, the next presentation, we're going to combine it by the Valley Wealth uh, Economic uh, uh, Symposium that they have. Why? Because uh, there are almost uh, 1,500 people show up, so we want to make it uh, uh, more informative and more accessible to the community. and then. Six months after that, we're going to have one. So one of them would be smaller, strictly for business leaders. The other one for uh, more broader uh, public. So we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your support.